So you can use your biceps brachii to pick up a pen. You can also use it to pick up a child or a dumbbell or a um, bucket full of bricks. Um, so you can use your muscles to different degrees. They are not just on or off. Although action potentials are on or off, muscle contraction has degrees. So what I want to ask um, and answer is how is the amount of tension that is generated in a whole muscle controlled? Well, first we have to look at what happens in a single fiber because a single fiber can have different degrees of contraction as well. So um, the concept of summation is what we're coming up with right now. So this was a single muscle twitch, okay? But now I wanna talk about how you can get one muscle fiber to contract contract minimally, maximally, or somewhere in between. So this concept is called summation. So what I can do is if a muscle fiber is stimulated once, then I get a single twitch. But if a muscle fiber is stimulated and then not allowed to relax completely before you stimulate it again, what will happen is the calcium that was there from the first time will get added to the calcium that was there from the second time. Now, um, so, the calcium released from the first action potential and the calcium released from the second action potential are added to one another. This of course means that the muscle fiber had to be out of absolute refractory period, but that's okay because muscle fibers actually um, come out of absolute refractory period a little faster than you would imagine that they do. So what happens here is I stimulated it, I started contracting, and then before it relaxed complete or before it completely relaxed, I've stimulated again. So the calcium that was there from the first time gets added to the calcium that was there from the second time. I have more tropomyosin moved out of the way, more access to cross bridge formation, and therefore I can generate more tension. This is called summation. This is a sustained average tension that I get as the twitches are added to one another. And what I can get is if I stimulate it frequently enough, I can get this average tension that pretty much stays constant and relatively high. Now, you won't notice the difference. Um, it's The average tension is relatively com constant. This is called incomplete or unfused tetanus. And it results and a high sustained level of contraction. Now, if you get into this stage, which is called complete tetanus or fused tetanus, the stimuli are coming so fast that there's no relaxation at all. This does not generally happen with normal physiology. It can happen with ion imbalances or with electrocution, and it's not going to be comfortable at all. So this is called complete or fused tetanus. Okay, so this is what I can do with a single fiber. I can either stimulate it more frequently and get more contraction or stimulate it less frequently and get less contraction. But of course, a muscle is not just made of one fiber. So now let's talk about how I can get a whole muscle to contract minimally, maximally, or something different. So this is called recruitment, and it basically has to do with how many muscle fibers in the muscle you are going to use for that contraction. It's also sometimes referred to as motor unit summation. So um, the number of muscle fibers contracting depends upon the number of motor neurons that are firing or stimulating it. So I need to introduce you to the concept of a motor unit. Okay, so this is some random muscle. I don't know which one. Let's say maybe it's the biceps brachii. And um, it doesn't just have two motor units, but go with me for the metaphor. The deal is that every single cell or muscle fiber in the biceps brachii is not controlled by the same motor neuron. Okay, they are separated out and controlled by different motor neurons. A motor neuron plus the fibers that it contracts is called a motor unit because they all kind of behave as one unit. If this motor neuron releases um, acetylcholine, it's going to release the, it at them all simultaneously-ish, except for the fact that the axons are slightly different. Um, but they basically are controlled together, right? You're gonna get an action potential, it's gonna go to the end of the axon terminals and cause acetylcholine release, and then they're all going to be depolarized. So this behaves as one unit, a motor unit. This one is a different motor unit, okay? <clears throat> so the number of motor neurons that are firing or sending an action potential 
is determined mostly involuntarily by the central nervous system. Like if I try to pick up a coffee cup, okay, my brain has had experience with how much tension it takes to pick up a coffee cup successfully. And so subconsciously, my brain is going to predict how many motor units are necessary to do that. And um, it's going to say, I think I'm going to need X number of motor units and try that. If the coffee, coffee cup was heavier than I expected it to be, then what would happen is my brain would continue to recruit more motor units until I either picked up the coffee cup or realized that I wasn't capable of picking up the coffee cup. So the number of motor neurons firing is determined involuntarily by the central nervous system. So what generally happens because the body is frugal is that um, you usually recruit the smaller motor units first. So you would do X, which had five fibers. And if that didn't work, you would do Y, which had seven fibers. And then if that didn't work, you would do X plus Y, which is 12 fibers, right? So this is called recruitment. This is how you get a whole muscle to con uh, contract minimally, maximally, or not at all. So um, now muscles are divided into motor units, as I mentioned, but not all muscles have the same number of motor units. So I want to think about two really different muscles based on the way that you use them. I want you to think about your extrinsic eye muscles, like uh, the lateral rectus, the medial rectus, all of those muscles. What I need with those is to be able to do really precise movements and move just a few fibers at a time. Contrast that with your gluteus maximus. And the gluteus maximus does not write any poetry. It is um, going to do relatively gross motor movements, big movements. So the deal is with motor units is if you have um, these two extremes of muscles and there are a lot in between, a muscle that uses primarily precise uh, movements, you're going to have relatively few fibers innervated by each neuron and your motor units are going to be small, 10 muscle fibers, um, and there's going to be a lot of them. Okay. Whereas with the gluteus maximus, if you are not writing any poetry and do not need to do fine motor movement, what you are going to have is one motor neuron that controls maybe 500 fibers at a time. So depending on whether you're dealing with precise or gross motor movements, that determines evolutionarily, you don't determine it, um, the size of the motor units. Okay. Last thing with this is just the concept of tone or tonic contraction. So the deal is if you um, have a whole muscle, um, the whole muscle has what's called tone. So if you know somebody who's in really, really good shape and you poke them, their muscle still has tone even if they're asleep, okay? Don't poke people without their permission. But your muscles still have tone. What this is, is a sustained partial contraction of portions of the muscle in response to stretch receptors. And what it's good for is it's good for maintaining posture, it's good for um, maintaining metabolism, it's good for stabilizing your joints. So, um, but it seems counterintuitive because two things I'll tell you about skeletal muscle is that they cannot maintain, an individual fiber cannot maintain a contraction for very long without completely wearing itself out. And we'll talk about lactic acid a little bit later. Um, but the whole muscle can maintain tone indefinitely. So how do those two things that seem like um, oxymoronic um, how are they both true? How can you not maintain contraction in a single fiber for very long, but maintain contraction in the whole muscle um, indefinitely? Well, what you do is you alternate firing the motor units. So motor unit X, Y, Z, A, B, delta, gamma, they alternate firing. And since the fibers are kind of spread out around the muscle, you don't notice any different in muscle, difference in muscle tone. So this tightens the muscle and gives it tone, but it doesn't produce movement because we're actually not trying to overcome the load. Even relaxed muscles have tone as long as they've got normal physiology. Tone is essential for maintaining posture. Now, 
Does it ever occur that you have a muscle with less than normal tone? Yes, when you have a muscle with less than normal tone, it's called flaccid. Not a word that anybody wants to hear, but a couple of reasons that that could occur. Denervation, atrophy, if you damage the nerve, yes, the muscle's paralyzed, okay? The muscle will, if this is permanent damage, like this is spinal cord damage, then it tends to be permanent, except for some experimental things that we have the capacity to do. Um, then what will eventually happen, especially if you do not exercise your muscles to keep them going, the muscle will eventually be replaced with connective tissue. And when that occurs, it's irreversible. So after a spinal cord injury, before you know whether the damage to the nervous system was permanent because it was CNS or um, could eventually regenerate because it was PNS, you must keep the muscle tissue alive. And this can be a couple years, actually. So um, this is denervation atrophy, damage to the nerve. The muscle is eventually replaced with connective tissue, and then it's irreversible. There is also disuse atrophy. And disuse atrophy would be like if you have a person who's bedridden, perhaps they're in a coma, um, or you've got a casted muscle. I know you're casting the bone, but you'll also get the muscle around it what happens is you start losing muscle tissue because of that, but that's reversible after short periods of time. Um, about four months um, is usually when it's still reversible. If that continues for two years and you haven't been exercising the muscle to keep it alive, then the muscle mass loss is reversible. Here is a picture of a guy with a great sense of humor who has paralysis because of polio. And one of the things that I'll teach you in just a minute is what polio does is it killed off somatic motor neurons. So he, in all likelihood, would have had uh, paralysis of his limbs in this picture um, because of what? Denervation or disuse atrophy? Yeah, since it kills off the um, somatic motor neurons, that's denervation atrophy, and eventually it's just irreversible because um, somatic motor neurons are mostly amitotic. Okay.